Hey everyone, welcome back to Vantage with AI. Today we're looking at Dream Omni 2, a new addition to the image generation and editing lineup that works beautifully with Flux Context Dev. This model blends a vision language model based on Quen 2.5 VL with two LoRa's, one focused on generation and the other on editing. In generation mode, Dream Omni 2 can take up to four reference images. They can be your sources for characters, objects, or even style, letting you mix and match creative elements while keeping pose and texture consistency. For editing mode, you only need two images. One is the main image you want to modify, and the other provides the source material. It could be a character design, outfit, or even a new aesthetic you want to apply. Now, full disclosure, Dream Omni 2 can be a bit quirky. Sometimes it won't hit the mark on the first run, but give it another go with a different seed, and it might just surprise you with something incredible. And normally, I never ask you to watch an entire video, but this time, I'd really recommend sticking around till the end. There are a few important things you'll want to know to really get the best out of this model. Otherwise, you and I might end up spending way too much time in the comments section trying to sort things out. Not that I don't enjoy your comments, but in this case, watching the full video might save us both a few extra coffees. All right, before we start, let's go over the models you'll need for this workflow. Flux Context Dev, available in BF16 or FP8 scale .safe tensors format. You can also use the GGUF version if you're running with limited VRAM. If you're using the GGUF build, make sure to enable the UNet loader node, connect its output to the LoRa loader's input, and disable the diffusion loader node. Flux Turbo Alpha LoRa. This LoRa lets you sample with just eight steps instead of the usual 28 to 30, while keeping image quality high and noise well under control. Next, you'll need the two Dream Omni 2 LoRas, one for editing and one for generation. Only one is active at a time, controlled by the toggle switch labeled Enable Edit Mode. When it's on, the editing LoRa is used. When it's off, the generation LoRa takes over. One quick note here, if you enable edit mode, please turn off enable image 3 and enable image 4. If those are left on by mistake, the prompt format will stay in generation mode, which can cause unpredictable results when using the editing LoRa. Now, for the VAE model, we'll be using AE.Safe Tensors, the default Flux VAE. Moving on to text encoders, you'll need two clip models, Clip L and T5XXL. Now, apart from these, you'll also need the Dream Omni 2 Prompt Enhancer model. Don't worry, it will be downloaded automatically on the first run into a folder named Dream Omni 2 inside your model's directory. It's roughly a 6 GB download, so it may take a little time, but only on the first run. If you prefer, you can also download it manually. Just create a folder named Dream Omni 2 inside your model's folder and download all the files from Hugging Face directly into it. All the download links for these models are already included in the workflow itself and also listed in the video description below, so be sure to grab them before running the workflow. And of course, don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications if you enjoy videos like this one. Now, let's quickly go through the main sections of this workflow so you know what each part does before we start running it. Models Loader Group. This is where you load all the required models. Your base model, LoRa's, VAE, and text encoders. Input section. Here, you'll add your input images, whether they're reference images for generation or your main and source images for editing. Prompt section. This is where you'll write your prompt, depending on whether you're generating a new image or editing an existing one. Sampling section. Here's where the actual image generation happens. The sampling nodes take the processed prompt and inputs to produce the final output image. And finally, the most important part, the controls section. This is where you can enable or disable the image inputs you want to use, and also select whether this run is for a new generation task or an editing task. Just remember, if you enable editing, please turn off. Enable image 3 and enable image 4. That's because if the prompt enhancer receives more than two images as input, it automatically formats the prompt for generation mode. When that happens while the editing LoRa is active, the results tend to look more like a generation output, but usually less accurate or inconsistent. So for editing mode, make sure to use only two image inputs. That's how the model was trained, and it performs best that way. All right, let's run our first test. For this, we'll be using these four images. Image one, the man in a suit. Image two, the woman wearing a white crop top. Image three, the Vantage with AI logo, which we'll place on her top. And image four, a reference image that will provide the overall visual style for our final output. 
Now, here's the prompt we'll be using for this run. The man from image one and the woman from image two are standing side by side. The woman from image two has the logo from image three on her tank top with the background of a lake. The style of the image is the same as in image four. Let's run it. As you can see, our simple prompt has been enhanced into a form the Dream Omni 2 generation Laura can interpret better. Later, in editing mode, I'll show its version 2. You'll spot some subtle differences between them. All right, here's the result from our first test run, and honestly, this turned out pretty solid for a first try. We can see that Dream Omni 2 understood the structure of the prompt really well. The result came out great. Both characters present, the logo sits naturally on the shirt, and the style matches the reference. A few pose tweaks, but that's normal. All right, for our next test, we're going to keep everything else exactly the same. The same input images, the same prompt, and the same settings. Except for one change, this time we're swapping out the fourth image, which controls the style reference. In our first test, we used a Disney-style reference. This time, we'll go with an anime-style reference image instead. So we're using the same prompt. Let's run it and check how it handles the shift to an anime-inspired style. Same prompt, same inputs, only the fourth image changes, and boom, the entire mood shifts. Sharper outlines, brighter colors, anime style eyes. It nailed the look while keeping the scene identical. All right, for our next test, we're going to push it a little further and see how well it handles multi-subject composition. We'll be using these four input images. Image one, the man in a navy suit. Image two, the woman in the white crop top and black skirt. Image three, the golden retriever wearing shades and a chain. And image four, the background, a red sports car racing through the night desert. And here's the prop we'll be using. The man from image one and the woman from image two are standing side by side. The dog from image three is standing between them. The background is from image four. Let's run it. Result? Pretty awesome. Lighting and tone match perfectly. It looks cinematic. Only small miss. The dog's a bit right of center instead of between them. Easy fix with prompt wording or a new seed. Otherwise, composition and balance are spot on. All right, for this next test, we're switching things up and trying out editing mode. We've disabled image 3 and image 4 and turned edit mode on. So only two images are active this time. Here's the setup. Image 1. The girl in a white crop top and black skirt. This will be our main image. And image two, the girl wearing the striped shirt. This will serve as our source reference. And here's the prompt we'll use. Make the girl's top from the first image have the same color scheme as the shirt in the second image. This test will help us see how well editing Laura handles localized attribute transfers. In this case, changing the color and pattern of the top while keeping everything else untouched. Let's run it and see how the edit comes out. Okay, so here's how the prompt enhancer formatted the prompt for edit mode. As you can see, it's structurally different from the one used in generation mode. It includes two clear sections, instruction, where it gives direct editing instructions, and caption, which defines the full scene. One important thing to note, if you provide more than two images, even when you tell the model it's an edit prompt, it still switches back to generation style formatting. And when that happens, the output ends up looking more like a generation result rather than a proper edit. All right, here's the result from our first editing mode test, and while it did work to some extent, there were a few issues worth noting. The main edit actually worked fine. The girl's top from the first image now carries the striped color scheme from the second image, just as we wanted. However, the output also included the second reference image on the right side, and there were some unwanted artifacts, like random text and signature, like markings, across the image. This happened because we set our output resolution to 1024 by 1024, while the main input image was in portrait orientation 480 by 832. In editing mode, it's important to match the output resolution's aspect ratio to your input image. Otherwise, the model tries to fill the extra space, which can cause visual glitches or include unwanted elements like these. So, we'll fix that by setting the output size to 720 by 1280, which aligns with the portrait aspect ratio of our main image. Everything else stays the same, and we'll run this test again. And here's the result after adjusting the output resolution. And this time, it worked exactly as expected. The top now has the striped color scheme from the reference image, applied cleanly and with good edge consistency. This confirms that in editing mode, maintaining the correct aspect ratio between your main input and output resolution is crucial. 
All right, for our final test, we're going to push editing mode a bit further and try a person swap. We'll be using these two images. Image one, a photo of a man and a woman standing indoors. This is our main image. And image two, the woman in a white crop top and black skirt. She'll be the replacement subject. Here's the prompt we'll be using. Replace the right person in the first image with the person in the second image. Let's run it. And here's the result from our final test, the person swap. And Dream Omni 2 handled this one surprisingly well. The woman on the right from the original image has been successfully replaced with the person from our second image, and the overall composition looks clean and realistic. Now, although the replacement image isn't an exact match of the original subject, the pose, facial angle, and proportions are slightly different, it's still quite close and visually coherent with the rest of the frame. All right, that wraps up our walkthrough of Dream On Me 2, and I think it's safe to say this model is quite a versatile addition to the Flux One Context Dev ecosystem. Yes, it's not perfect. Sometimes it'll miss small details like positioning or produce unexpected results on the first try. But often, just changing the seed code or tweaking the prompt phrasing can give you something amazing. If you found this walkthrough helpful, don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. That way, you won't miss out when I dive into the next set of Flux-compatible models and advanced workflow tricks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.